Grace, peace, and mercy to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, this, this, is a, um, this is probably one of the, well, these words of Jesus are so incredibly powerful to me, and I, and I hope they are to you, too. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, actually uh, almost two months, we've been looking at this series, talking about our faith, right, that we need a real faith to face some of the struggles and challenges that we have in this real world that we live in. And one of the struggles and challenges that we have is is trouble and grief. Uh, We are in need of God's comfort. And there's a lot of things that we can do to comfort ourselves, no doubt. Um, If you're a kid, maybe even an adult, a little blanket or a pillow might work pretty good for a period of time. But, But as our problems and challenges grow, Uh, So does sometimes some of the ways that we seek to comfort ourselves. Uh, Some of them good, some of them not so good. What we need is a faith that seeks comfort in in Jesus Christ. And so that's really our our goal, our thought today, is to look at this text to see how Christ continues to provide comfort. Let me share the story with you once again. Now you heard it read just a few moments ago. We uh, kind of lived it out a little bit with Grace telling it to the kids as well. But let me give you a little background to the story that kind of helps us understand it maybe just a little better. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been following this uh, portion of scripture. So you kind of know, you've heard what's gone on, right? Jesus had sent the disciples out two by two. They were going to go out and they were going to uh, share this message. And the message was one that was a difficult message. It was that they would repent of their sins and turn to Christ. While some, some no doubt didn't see themselves as sinful, some would turn their backs upon them. In fact, Jesus gave them instruction as they left the town where they weren't invited to stay, that they would shake the dust from their feet as a testimony to to this place and their rejection of Christ. Some rejected them. The disciples then went on to other places that did receive the message. But this was hard work. It was difficult. They were casting out demons for heaven's sake. They were were, uh, leaning and trusting in God. They didn't take anything with them. No no extra clothes, no food, no nothing. They were living on and and, and for uh, the protection of God and, and the work of God. When they returned, it was time for them to rest. And in fact, that's what they were planning to do. They were going to go and they were going to rest with Jesus. They were, they were going to hear about what had happened. They were going to uh, tell Jesus about what had happened. But as soon as they returned, they heard the news that John the Baptist had been beheaded. As soon as they returned, they not only heard that news, but they were heading across the, the lake. You heard the story, right? They were heading across the lake. Uh, another storm came. They, they made it to the other side of the lake and there were crowds of people. And the crowds of people were hungry. The crowds of people were like what Jesus said. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had compassion on them, invited the disciples to get back to work again. Jesus said, feed them. Of course, they didn't have any food. So Jesus multiplied the bread and the fish. And they fed thousands of people as they ministered and cared for them. Well, they were exhausted again. Jesus sent them out across the lake in the boat while he uh, tucked away and went up on the hillside to pray. Well, now this is where the story picks back up. There is no doubt they were tired. There's no doubt they were exhausted. There's no doubt that they needed some time of rest. They, They were probably also filled with some element of fear. They had just recently heard about the beheading of John. They knew that even though they were following Jesus, even though they were trusting, even though they were working for Jesus... There was still trouble that came at every, well, every time they turned around. And here it was again. They're struggling against the wind and the waves. Jesus saw them. He knew that they were in trouble. He walked across the water. This was not just a trick. It wasn't just a way for him to display his power over creation. He walked across the water and, and, and they were terrified. So Jesus came to them. Simply to give them comfort. I love his words. Don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. That's some good stuff. And and the wind and the waves stopped. I I love each part of that. If he were to say one of those things, it would certainly be enough. To say all three, uh, to live all three is, is even better. Right? Don't be afraid. Even though you see all this stuff going on, even though there's trouble in your life, uh, don't be afraid. 
Take courage, he said. He didn't say, let's turn back. He didn't say this was too hard. He didn't say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out. No, he said, take courage. We're going to move ahead. There's going to be more to come. And then finally, he said the best words of all, I'm here. This is the kind of uh, comfort that they needed right at that moment, no doubt about it. It's also the kind of comfort that we need. Um, let me just share a brief story with you. Uh, a time where uh, myself, uh, Penny, our marriage, our, our home, our life, well, we needed comfort. Um, I was reminded of this yesterday because, uh, as we said, we just moved. And uh, we just moved across town. It was an easy move. We still got uh, same church, same friends. But I was reminded of a time in our life where we moved away. It was when, uh, way back when, uh, we left Omaha for the first time to move to St. Louis, Missouri so that I could attend seminary. Uh, it was a tough move. Uh, and, and, you know, it was one of those times where, where we packed all our stuff up, left jobs, left home. We moved to a city away from parents, grandparents, friends, family members, uh, church family. Uh, we're heading to a new place where we didn't really know anybody. Penny got a job, uh, had a job. Um, I was going to go to school. The kids were still in school. Uh, this was a, well, kind of a terrifying time, but an exciting time, too. But I got to say, at least in our, don't listen to this part. This was the hard part of a move. Um, but when we got there, for us, it was, it was hard. It was super hard um, for a lot of different reasons. One of the main reasons why it was so difficult is because we kind of were pulled apart as a family. Um, I, I had to dedicate myself to school, and so, man, I was kind of, I was on my own. I had to dedicate some time to school. It was, you know, this academic life of seminary was a lot harder than I had anticipated. It was time consuming. Penny had to kind of be pulled in this direction because she was the, well, she was paying the bills. She was supporting our family. So she had to spend her time focused on her work. The kids, well, they had to focus on their school because new school, new teacher, new friends, new everything. And, and, and because we were kind of pulled apart, I think that's one of the main reasons that it was so hard. Also, we didn't really have a church. Um, crazy enough, we were waiting for this assignment to come from the seminary of where we could go and stay. So we could go and worship at a place, but, but we really couldn't get connected, not quickly, and, and we were going to be just moved again to another place soon. So we were kind of without a, a real church family. And we were all dealing with our challenge in a unique and different way, kind of on our own way, right? Some of us sad, some of us scared, some of us angry. And, and so it really messed with us. It was hard for our marriage. It was hard for uh, our kids. It was hard for them. Well, it was hard for the kids' parents as well. Um, it was probably one of those times where I felt like you know, this, what are you doing, God? Here I am, we're moving, I'm serving you. I'm following what you want me to do. And now look at this mess that you've gotten us into, God. Um, where are you? And I, I imagine you've been there too. Let me tell you just briefly um, how God showed his presence to us. It wasn't this overnight thing. It wasn't this instantaneous thing. But, but I do believe, even looking back, that God revealed his presence to us in a couple of different ways that were powerful. We, um, we kind of banded together with a, a group of other uh, families because we, they were in the same boat. So fellow students of mine, their wives, their kids, their families, and, and, and out of necessity, we kind of clung together. And so immediately we had this community again. A community of kind of strangers, but, but a community that was strong and powerful. We were kind of going through the same stuff. And so we could uh, help each other out. We were having dinner together. We would go to their house. They'd come to our house. And we had this group of, well, it was a community. And we could be honest with them and straightforward with them. Uh, God spoke to us and showed his presence through that community of people. It was, you know, not, not to press these words, but it was like Christ saying, don't be afraid. Take courage. I'm here. I'm here in this community of people. There was another way, too. We uh, finally got assigned to a church. We had a church home. We could worship together again. We could pray together. 
We sought out some help from somebody that reminded us of the importance of simply talking to our kids, praying with our kids, spending time with the kids, helping them with the adjustment. Uh, we were no longer being pulled in several directions. We were together with those that were closest to us. And even through our, our marriage, our life, our kids, our family, we were reminded of those words. Not specifically those words, but they could have been spoken. They could have been lived out. Right? Don't be afraid. Take courage. I'm here. I'm here right in your family, Christ's sake. And then finally, we had that blessing of having a church where we could worship together. Receive communion together. Hear about the forgiveness of Christ together. No doubt we could come into a worship setting and we could, we could see and hear and know the presence of Christ. He would say, uh, don't be afraid, take courage, I am here. I am here even within this worshiping community to give you, to give you comfort. I, I know... Uh, I know there's probably similar things going on in your life, right? That, that this, this might be the very time where you need to be comforted by God. Maybe it's because of a loss in your family. Maybe it's because of a, a difficulty in your marriage. Maybe it's a, a, a difficulty financially that you need comfort. And you might be saying, here I am serving you, God. Where are you? And, and you know what? If, you, if this is not a time where you're really needing the comfort of God, well, just wait. You know this is true. We live in a real world with real problems. Next week is probably your week. Next month it might be coming, right? There's going to be a day, there's going to be a time where you need the comfort of God. And here's what we normally do. It's just the opposite of what we read about today. It's just the opposite of what we hear. What we normally do, naturally do, is what we, we need that kind of comfort. We are, when we listen to the lies that Satan would tell us, and we separate ourselves from the very means by which God gives us comfort. We separate ourselves from our community, right? We separate ourselves from that community of people that would best give us those messages, those words, those comforts of God. We isolate ourselves from everyone else. Or we separate ourselves from clearly speaking to our spouse or to our kids or our family or those closest to us. Or we listen to that lie of Satan and and in our time of great need, we separate ourselves from his church. So instead, if you are in that position where you need comfort today, let me remind you just very briefly again how God gives comfort. He gives it first through your community. It's a community of believers just like this. Right? It's your community of believers. You could walk into this place. You could see somebody. You could call them up. You could go to their home. Right, This community of people. And you don't have to pretend that everything is okay. If somebody asks how you're doing, it's okay to say, I need your prayers. Would you pray with me right now? If somebody's asking how you're doing and you're not doing well, say, I'm not doing well. It's okay to be honest. It's a sign of strength to be honest so that your community can share with you yet again those very same kinds of words. Don't be afraid. Take courage. Christ is here in this community with you. It's also true that if you're needing comfort, you probably, if you're married, you should look to your spouse for that. That's the person that God has placed you with to give you the very comfort that God provides. Maybe there's another person. If you're unmarried, there, maybe it's a friend or maybe it's a fiance. Maybe it's a... Uh, maybe it's a, a best friend. Maybe it's a parent. Right? Don't listen to that lie that Satan would say to, to separate those that are closest to you. Instead, God would give you comfort through those that are closest to you. That he would say once again, don't be afraid, take courage. I am here in your marriage. I am here in your relationship with your parents, with your kids, with your grandkids. And finally, if you need comfort... God promises to be present with us, even right here in our worship. As you come to that communion table and you hold out your hand to receive the presence of Christ, that's where he's promised to be. Don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. I am here in this meal. Even as we stand up and speak the creed and, and it reminds us of our baptism and God says to us, uh, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. I'm here in the waters of baptism to claim you as my own. He's here as we confess our sins and we receive his word. He's here as his word is shared and proclaimed. 
He's promised to be here, and he is. You need courage, you need comfort, you're going through a hard time, God will speak to you and be present to you through your, through your closest community, and even through your church. You know, sometimes we can read words like this, and, and we can read stories like this, and we can say, boy, how awesome, though, that they had the physical presence of Jesus. Wouldn't it be awesome if he could step into our boat, if he could speak to us in those very words? But, you know, we have something I think that's even better. <clears throat> we have a full story. We have the word, the word of God proclaimed to us that tells us exactly what happened. He tells us how he came to the cross to die for our sins. He tells us how he overcomes the grave. He tells us that he is coming back again. So, so even today, or any day that when you're seeking comfort, remember the full story of Jesus. Right? Because, because here he is, this image of Jesus on the cross. And he says, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here on the cross, dying for your sins to give you forgiveness and new life. Or we have this image of Jesus at the empty tomb. And he says, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here at the empty tomb, victorious over the grave, even for you. Or we see Jesus, this image of Jesus standing at the right hand of God, prepared to come again, to take us to be with him in glory. And he says, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. I am here prepared to come back for you. That's the comfort that we need. Um, say them with me again. Don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. One more time. Don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. Amen. It's good to worship with you. Um, we continue our worship with an opportunity to.